Hello. Okay, it's day 16. I'm on page I'm on page 124 and I had a little go of it, but I'm restarting. So basically I'm just going to summarize the half a page I read, but don't worry, it's not I don't think it's cheating for me to summarize this because it was a quote from Al Smith that took up an entire page pretty much. Basically, Robert Caro was trying to demonstrate how eloquent Al Smith is, like, and he is. The, he pretty much just like had this big like soliloquy moment about how, um, um, what happens when death takes from the family the provider? Like, what happens when a widowed mother has to um, try to live in New York? And what happens a lot is the state would like commit her children to some charity institution, which isn't actually the best solution. And he says. Um, that is the old system. That is the dark day we are walking away from. That is the period that, by this policy, we are attempting to forget. He ends um, with, like, a really strong call to action. We are pledged to conserve uh, the natural resources of the state. Millions of dollars of the taxpayer's money, untold and uncounted millions, have been poured into that channel. We have been in a great hurry to legislate for the interests. We have been slow to legislate along the direction that means thanksgiving to the poorest man in recorded history. He was born in the stable at Bethlehem. So the gist is like, wow, Al Smith, uneducated mayor, he's actually really good at writing and he is saying a lot of poignant messages to the people that they like. Okay, so that's what, yes. Now we're going back to the page 125, which is Robert Caro. Yes. Al Smith's eloquence was useless in the 1912 session because the Republicans had recaptured control of the assembly. But in November 1912, the Democrats grabbed it back, and Murphy had the party's caucus elect Smith Assembly Speaker for the 1913 session. He had never dreamed, Al Smith told friends, that an uneducated person, it's using a word that I think might be a, a derogatory term, so I'm just to be careful, I'm not saying it, um, from the fourth word, could rise so high, that he might rise higher, he was to say, never crossed his mind. He had, after all, about reached a point beyond which, in America, no Al Smith had ever risen. No Catholic had ever been given a presidential nomination ever. Nor, for that matter, any Irish Tammany man a nomination for high statewide office. A governor or a U.S. senator was supposed to, in the words of one historian, present an image in appearance, speech, and manners appropriate to his high office. And somehow it was incongru incongruous to think of an Irishman up from the city streets in such a post. Tammany, man, Tammany men, while they might not say so, felt that way themselves. They felt unpolished and crude and very uneducated beside the uptowners. And they never pushed themselves forward for the top spots. As Assembly Speaker, Smith was all that Tammany could have desired, building up the organization's patronage and power and pushing through liquor law amendments that allowed the sale of alcoholic beverages at hotels that Charlie Murphy favored and forbade such sales at hotels that Silent Charlie did not. Silent Charlie, can't remember exactly who he is, but he was like in, he was in that whole world of like Tammany rough and tumble Democrats. Okay. Some observers bemoaned Smith's lack of dignity. Pounding at his gavel with great swings of his arm, bellowing parliamentary rulings in a hoarse, gravel voice that one writer called a bull of Bashan roar, he sometimes seemed to them like a carnival barker. He sometimes ate lunch on the podium. He talked with food in his mouth. That is really poignant. Robert Caro, sorry for the interruptions, but Robert Caro, like, I was just talking to my friend about this, how he doesn't really do that many short sentences. And when he does, they're always just, like, such zingers. He talked with food in his mouth. That's, like, you could just sum up the whole chapter with that. Like, he's just a guy that talks a lot, but with food in his mouth because he's improper. Anyway... But seldom in the history of the legislature had its business been transacted so smoothly and expeditiously, cutting short long-winded speakers, hustling routine bills through at a rate that reporters clocked at eight per minute. Smith, eight bills a minute. Smith was, on the high speaker's podium, a commanding figure. And if Smith fought for Tammany's bills, he did not stop fighting for the factory commissions. 
By the end of the session, many of them had been passed, even a revolutionary workmen's compensation measure. In 1914, the Republicans regained power. Albany was filled with high-priced lobbyists representing insurance companies. Amendments to the compensation measure were introduced that looked innocent, but would in reality tear out its heart. I don't know what the compensation measure is. All the amendments did, their sponsors protested, was provide that there could be direct settlements between workmen and insurance companies instead of enforced report, instead of enforced resorts to the machinery provided by the Workmen's Compensation Act of 1913. All that they did was enable the working man to get money sooner. Quote, and for whom are you doing this? Smith demanded as he stood in the well of the chamber and faced the Republicans. Those of them who were his friends saw not a hint of friendliness in his eyes now. Does the working man want it? No. Does the legislator want it? No. Does the compensation commission want it? Then what other interested party is there? The casualty company. That's who you are working for. The agent can shake the long green before the widow or suffering laborer and tell them if they sign away their rights, they can get so much. But if they wait, they can take their chances on getting something months hence. That carries, carries us back to the good old days when we had no compensation law. Be honest and repeal the whole law and stop faking. A Republican legislator rose to protest, but Smith's voice cracked like a whip. You and your governor have ruined the compensation law, he said. You have gone the limit for the casualty companies. The people's case is lost. Up in the high galleries that over... Hello! Welcome! Wow, sorry, I didn't even notice that you had joined. I got so excited. The very quick vert summary is that I'm in Portland, and so I've been doing this at weird times. And um, it kind of turned into a biography of the governor, Al Smith, who was really uneducated, grew up kind of poor. He was Irish. And then now he then he like went and got a job and um, it was in Albany working in like the New York State. I don't know. Assembly, New York State Assembly. And he like went from being like only eighth grade education to being like just like this like super um, well read. Like he would read all the bills and no one else would. And then he kind of just like rose the ranks and everyone loved him. And um, yeah, so that's what we're doing right now. We're le learning all about Al Smith. Okay, up in the high galleries that overlooked the floor, the reformers stood and cheered. The compensation might, the compensation law might be lost, but they knew the Republicans would never dare touch the others now. Great advances had been secured. And more importantly, at last they had their champion. Smith, the Tammany man, had made their dreams come true. They hastened to hang others on his lance. You're watching from Singapore. Wow, I was in Singapore um, like not that long ago because the um, Wikimania conference was in Singapore this year in August and it was really fun. I ate a lot of, um, what's it called? Like the hakas or something, Haka, haka stands. I ate really good food and it was like, like Singapore in general was not cheap, but the food was really cheap and delicious. So get some, get some Hakka. It's called like Hakka stand. Haka, oh, the Hawker Center. It was delicious. Um, okay. But even when Smith took up the banners, the banner of the reformers, he never put down the mace of the practical politician. He himself made no bones about this fact. If cynics said that he had recognized in child labor, disability insurance, and workmen's compensation a great political issue, Smith said it too. When someone told him that his views were antagonizing factory owners, he would laugh and say that factory owners lived on Fifth Avenue and that there's no Democratic votes on Fifth Avenue. They're all over 9th and 10th, where I live. Um, fighting for the working man for better working conditions for women, women and children that he knew was an issue on which you couldn't miss. The man who fought for the commission's legislation would be a man fighting on the side of the angels. Supporting its recommendations was more than good politics. It was the best politics. Okay, another aside is that I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I just saw online that there's a, um, a museum of vacuum cleaners here, and I feel like I have to go. How could I not? I don't really know that much about vacuum cleaners, but I want to. So 
I'm going to do that tomorrow. When he had, in some instances, to drop either the banner or the mace, it wasn't the mace that fell. In the 1915 Constitutional Convention, he fought for the Municipal Research Bureau's recommended reorganization of the state government. Of all the issues raised by the reformers, reorganization was the one he most eagerly embraced because his years in Albany had allowed him to see for himself the almost incredible inefficiency of the system. But on the morning of August 27, 1915, Smith, who had spent all of August 26 fighting to shoulder with the federal crowd for reorganization, waited in the Capitol entrance hall for progressive Republican Frederick C. Tam Tanner. And when Tanner arrived, arrived, Smith pulled him aside. Fred, Smith said, I've got to pull out on you in this debate. As Tanner recalled it later, now it's a quote from Tanner. I said, what's the matter? And he said, well, I had a telephone call from the old man last night. I said, do you mean 14th Street? And he said, yes. Of course, this meant that Mr. Murphy had decided that the Democratic organization would oppose the Constitution when it was finally submitted on Election Day and that it would not do so for Smith to give his support to a bill in the convention when the party would, would oppose it in its submission. I, maybe you guys understood that. I didn't really understand what that meant. After the convention, Smith campaigned against the proposed new reorganized constitution. Like, are, like what's? I guess I just don't know what the constitutional convention is. Like, I feel like that was a thing that happened in the the seventeen seventies. But maybe this is just the New York Constitution. See again, it's, it's a masterpiece. Okay, I'm not disputing it, but I would have loved to know more about what it is. After the convention. Smith campaigned against the proposed new reorganized constitution. First and foremost, he was a party man. Even though Smith felt that at times, even though Smith felt that times and people's needs were changing, he did not try to break away from the party, but to change it to meet the times. Every Friday evening, Tammany's Sacums, S-A-C-H-E-M-S, would meet for dinner in a private room at Delmonico's restaurant which still exists, and people love it, Delmonico's. I've never been, but people talk about it a lot, and apparently it's one of the oldest. I just know that it's it has like a legacy of being really old in a cool and good way. And also, if you're ever in New York and you want to go to more old things in Manhattan, you can go to McSorley's Air Ale House, which is allegedly, like, allegedly the longest-running bar in New York City. And they have really watery beer, shockingly watery. And then they have a thing called a cheese plate, but it's like really, um, it's really bare bones in a cool way. Like it's, um, I think it's like mustard, saltines, and then cheese that's not fancy, but it really hits the spot. And it makes you feel like you are living in the 1800s. And I vividly remember that there were chicken wish, but like wishbones from, um, poultry and they were hanging above the bar and the story goes that when guys like young men had to go off for world war one they put the wishbones up at mcsorley's like their favorite bar and they wished that they would come home someday after the war and the ones that came home took the wishbones and the ones that died obviously could not take the wishbones and then i got really sad but anyway, you can go there. And also Delmonico's is another cool place to go with New York history. Back to the book. In those meetings with Tammany, Smith began to try to persuade the older men that the party should begin taking a different stance. Tammany had always held the allegiance of the lower classes with the turkey baskets at Christmas and the outings of the civil service jobs but now people were becoming better educated, he said. Their needs were broadening and increasing. They were beginning to ask for more and to look for government to provide that more. Tammany should become the champion of social welfare legislation. It should do so because it was the party of the people and the new needs of the people were real needs. And it should do so because it was good politics, 
Why should Tammany take a chance of losing the massed votes of the Lower East Side to uptown reformers who even now were sponsoring such legislation? From the head of the table, Silent Charlie. Listen, si I also I can't remember who Silent Charlie is, but I think he's a Tammany person. He's in the Tammany posse. Silent Charlie listened silently to Smith and other young Sakums, S-A-C-H-E-M-S, still don't know what that means, like Wagner. Murphy knew that Tammany must change. He knew it because of the reasons the young men gave, and he knew it because of a consideration of his own. Never had one of their own kind risen to governor or senator. Never, despite the power of Kelly and Croker before him, never, despite his own power, had a Tammany man ever come even close to the top prize in the Democratic Party for which Tammany supplied so many of the votes. Always, Tammany was thought of as the party of Tweed and Kelly and Croker, don't know any of them, of the poor from the old country, who might be fit to sw sw sweep the streets, but not to sit in the governor's mansion or the White House. Becoming identified with progressivism, being known as the party of social progress, would be a way to shatter that image forever. Pushing to the forefront bright young men identified with such causes rather than with the ancient rituals of Tammany would be a way to spawn candidates who would shatter forever the unseen but heavy chains that weighed down the Irish Catholics in America. Why already wasn't at least one of his bright young men as true to Tammany, as loyal, as regular, as even he, Charlie Murphy, could wish, also the object of praise by the good government organizations, which habitu habitually damned anyone who sat around the table in Delmonico's. Okay, so it took me a second to put this together, but all the reformers are Robert Moses people, and this is like Tammany, the institution's, that are really populist and resistant to change, and they're supported by the Irish Catholic poor vote. But it just took me a second to realize, like the reformers um, that are trying to get Tammany to change, that's Robert. That's that's all the people that Robert Moses used to be working for. Anyway, hadn't the young man, once assailed by the Citizens Union, recently received one of its highest ratings? Hadn't he been praised in the Herald? Charlie Murphy looked down the table at the young man. He gave the okay for Tammany to sponsor the legislation the man wanted. He built up the young man's reputation by running him for sheriff of New York County in 1915 and for president of the New York City Board of Aldermen in 1917. And in 1918, he wrenched from the grip of the upstate Democratic leaders the Democratic nomination for governor and handed it to... Alfred E. Smith. This is getting good. This is getting good. Okay, next paragraph. 128 is the page. When Smith won, it was the 16th time he had run for public office and the 16th time he had won, the inaugural parade up Albany State Street was led by the 69th <laughs> Regiment of the National Guard, New York City's own fighting 69th. The sidewalks along the route and the steps of the Capitol at its end were packed with Smith's neighbors from the Fourth Ward. Aww. All the night before, arriving by the thousands on trains from New York, they had tramped the streets of Albany and jammed the restaurants, hoisting beer steins in toast to the new governor and singing a new catchy two-step called a song called The Sideway Sidewalks of New York. Cool. I would love to look that up and see see how it sounds. Their presence was symbolic. Smith's election was the triumph of the immigrants, the oath he took on the Capitol steps the next morning, as his mother stood in place of honor at his side, the first ever taken in America for a state's highest office in the accent of Ireland. He, how did, wow. It's interesting that, um, like, I know this isn't unique, but he was born in America, but he was just so surrounded by Irish people that he still had the Irish accent. I think that is unique and cool. Okay, I'm looking up the song The Sidewalks of New York because I'm curious. The Sidewalks 
of New York song. Wow, there's a Wikipedia article about it. The Sidewalks of New York what is a popular song about life in the New York City in New York City during the 1890s. It was composed in 1894 by vaudeville actor and singer Charles B. Lawler. It was immediate and long-lasting hit and considered a theme to New York. Down in front of Casey's old and wooden stoop. I'm trying to read music based on this, but I'm not like a, I'm not actually a singer, so that could be wrong. But, um, cool. Good stuff. This is like a really thorough Wikipedia article. Someone put a lot of beautiful time and effort into it. Good stuff. I'm going to see, no, okay, sorry. I'm just going to see if I know, um, the person that wrote the article. What's it called? The Sidewalks of New York. Um, an 1894 popular song about life in New York City. Nope. The person that wrote the article is named Roll Saibing, and I have never met them. And this is a really unpopular Wikipedia article. It gets, like, about as many views as, like, I don't even know. It doesn't get that many views. <laughs> um, okay. During Smith's first term... It was not that he broke loose from his party, but that the party freed him. Shortly after the election, Murphy summoned him to his Long Island estate, good ground. Tammany would be asking him for many things, Tammany's leader said. Okay, so Murphy is Tammany's leader. Tammany would be asking him for many things, but he had been thinking of what it meant to have a boy from the old neighborhood in the governor's chair. Should Tammany ever ask for anything Smith felt would stand in the way of becoming a great governor, all Smith had to do was tell him so, and their request would be withdrawn. There were, no, there were to be no strings attached to the job. Smith was about to be his own man. And for a start, Murphy said, Smith would not have to worry about patronage considerations. He and Foley would keep the job hunters off the governor's back. Smith reappointed deserving Republicans to their judgeships and administrative posts and brought into his inner circle reformers like Bell Moskowitz, Francis Perkins, tall, olive-skinned, mustached Joseph Proskauer, and to head the highway department, that trough of fatty contracts at which Tammany had been hoping to feed. What a fun, that is a fun line of writing. Um, Colonel Frederick Stuart Green an urbane engineer who wrote short stories and who displayed a complete indifference to the demands of politics in the administering of his department. The governor did so not only because he shared Murphy's dream and not only because he genuinely wanted to help the state's urban masses, but also because it was good politics. Grover Cleveland, he pointed out to his friends, had become a national figure because the idea got around the country that he was independent of everybody. Smith's policies were progressive. In his first term, he bludgeoned the legislator, legislature into restoring the workers' compensation law, increased the state's contributions to teachers' salaries by $22 million, and fought for governmental reorganization and for shorter hours and better working conditions for women and children, for the same mixture of reasons. I'm getting a sip of coffee. Ugh. Smith had no patience for those who didn't understand those reasons. He had no patience for reformers who, unlike Bal Moskowitz, didn't understand the importance of practical politics in getting things done, who refused to compromise, who insisted on having the bill as it was written, who raged loudly, loudly at injustice, who fought single-mindedly for an unattainable ideal. Their pig-headedness had the effect of dragging to a political destruction politicians who listened to them of ruining careers men had taken years to build. He'd seen it happen. And more importantly, what was the inevitable result of their efforts? Since they refused to compromise and operate within the political framework, the only framework within their proposals, within which their proposals could become reality, the laws they proposed were never enacted. And therefore, 
at the end of their efforts, the people they had wanted to help, the people who he knew so well needed help, hadn't been helped at all. If anything, they had been hurt. The stirring up of hard feelings and bitterness delayed less dramatic but still useful reforms that might have been enacted. When the reformers were finished with all their hollering and were back in the comfortable homes, the widows of the fourth ward would still be forced to give up their children before they could get charity. What good was courage if its only effect was to hurt those who you were trying to help? So Smith despised the non-compromisers, the starry-eyed idealists. He despised, in other words, most reformers. He coined words to describe them. Mush brains, double domes, crackpots, goo-goos. Al Smith despised, in short, what Bob Moses had been. But he didn't despise Bob Moses. That was a one-paragraph sentence. One sentence paragraph. There were other reformers who were personally friendly to the governor and who were vital to his political future. Men his own age, like wealthy Abram Elkis, and men, men's, men Moses' age, like Proskauer. But Elkis and Proskauer were seldom, if ever, invited up to the Oliver Street flat for dinner. For Moses, during 1921 and 22, the invitations came more and more often. If, after dinner, old cronies from the neighborhood would drop by and take Smith out to the local taverns for a drink and song or two around the backroom piano, Smith insisted that Moses come along. In fact, discovering that Moses had a passable bass to go with his tenor, he insisted that Moses be a part of whatever quartet was hastily arranged for the evening's barber shopping. Dude, the 1920s were crazy. that They were just like, oh, let's have a barbershop quartet there. And when Moses tried to beg off, Smith would drag him out of his seat and make him stand beside and harmonize. The reason for the attachment was uncertain. As one of Smith's cronies put it, they were opposites, two exact opposites, opposites all the way down the line. Was it, as some fourth warders, given to cliché, speculated, a father and son relationship? Given the affection Smith bore for his own three sons, this seemed too pat an explanation, although it was not difficult to understand why some believed it. Emily Smith, don't know who that is, would recall how, one night after dinner, her father, who had been making pointed remarks for weeks about the pale blue Brooks Brothers shirt that seemed to com comprise Moses's entire shirt collection, suddenly heaved himself out of his chair at the dinner table and strode into the bedroom. Returning with a large box, he said to Moses, I'm tired of looking at your blue shirts, so I bought you some. And opening the box, he spilled out in striped and silken profusion a dozen of Solka's bests. The Smiths certainly began to treat Moses like one of the family. He was like an artist in a way, Emily would recall. He was dressed not dirtily, but as if he didn't care. His suits might be okay, but they were obviously quite old or not well-pressed. We always kidded him about his clothes. One night after dinner, he started to leave, and Dad said, Emily, you go down with Bob and see he doesn't take one of my hats and leave it his here. And I can still see Dad and Bob laughing there. Or was the reason for the attachment, as other acquaintances speculated, that Al Smith, who outwardly lacked at his lack of formal education and never seemed to mind his lack of money, actually felt both lacks keenly and was thus ready to be impressed by a man he thought had such a wealth of both? Was it, as some reformers thought, <clears throat> that... Since Smith preferred to get his information from people rather than books and memos, he needed around him advisors who could talk fluently on concepts of government and who could describe situations and projects so vividly that he could see them in his mind's eye. And Moses, with his gift of words, was simply the most fluent and descriptive of talkers. Or was it that the man who had worked so hard to learn the art of government was able to tell exactly how hard another man had worked to learn that art and knew that Bob Moses had, in different circumstances, worked as hard as he? Was it that the man who had learned the art so thoroughly that it must have been boring for him to talk with even the most knowledgeable of his advisors had found a man who had learned it as well as he? One thing was certain. Whatever the reason for the feeling, it was there. Next paragraph. And therefore, if the man who despised what Bob Moses had been liked, what, who... And therefore, if the man who despised what Bob Moses had been liked, 
Moses so much. If the man who despised who, if the man who despised what Bob Moses had had been liked Moses so much, Moses must have greatly changed. Next sentence, next paragraph. He had. <gasps> okay, I'm gonna read a little bit more, but not that much more. And then I'm gonna um, then I'm gonna chill out. For the first part of the Smith interregnum, Moses seemed to be the reformer he had always been. The Reconstruction Commission, of course, <clears throat> went out of existence with the ouster from power of the governor it had been advising. Within days after the 1920 election, Mrs. Moskowitz had to tell Moses that there remained in the commissioner's ex e x c h e q e r ex chiquer only enough funds to pay his very small stipend and the rent on the very small office at 305 Broadway until the end of the year. Moses faced the prospect of being cut out of a job again on January 1st, 1921. But in late November 1920, a tall, elegantly dressed, cheerful, and charming man walked into the little office. He was Richard Spencer... Isn't that... Okay. Richard Spencer Childs. I hope that's not the the famously racist one, but it's certainly not because it's a different time period. Whom Moses had heard of but never met, although Childs had graduated from Yale just a year before him. Richard Childs was the very model of the scientific management reformer. Seeing politics in terms of good and evil, the latter was a term he used in connection with Tammany, he had determined to remove the possibility of evil from municipal government in the U.S., and make it efficient, economic, and business-like. Having inherited the having inherited the public relations genius that had enabled his father to clean up millions with a new soap powder named Bon Ami, he had already succeeded in cheerfully cheerfully forcing down the throats of more than a hundred astounded municipalities, a nonpartisan city manager form of government. Finding that a single cause did not quench his thirst for reform. <clears throat> he had become concerned by the fact that while New York City had a citizen union to rate the city's legislators, act as watchdog over city spending, and publish a bulletin that gave civic-minded citizens the information they needed to play their proper role in city government, there was no similar organization that covered the state as a whole and could exert a statewide influence for good. I need a sip. Childs decided to put up the money to start one, but he found he had a personnel problem. With his own time fully occupied, he would have to leave the new organization almost entirely in someone else's hands, and reviewing the list of re his reform acquaintances, he concluded that none of them could handle the job. Then one evening, doing his nightly reading of publications dealing with government that poured into his apartment from every part of the U.S., he turned to one he had put aside for several months because of its length. The report of the Reconstruction Commission to Governor Alfred E. Smith. Richard Childs had read thousands of such reports. He had written dozens himself. He knew exactly how good this one was. He spent most of the night reading it, and in the morning, he walked directly from his breakfast table to 305 Broadway. Quote, I needed no recommendations, he would recall. I had to read the work. Finding Moses at his desk in the little office, Childs introduced himself, announced that he was about to form a statewide good government organization, and offered him a post, which he explained would unfortunately carry only a small salary as a secretary and executive officer. Childs had expected the man across the desk to say that he would consider the offer, that he would let him know in a day or two. <coughs> at the least, he had expected to be asked some questions. Instead, without even a pause, Moses replied in a single word, yes. Okay, I'm going to read um, like one more paragraph, and then I'll be on a new page. Moses' acceptance of the offer elevated him instantly to a position of new importance in the reform movement. <clears throat> a statewide... <coughs> A statewide association of leading reformers to both parties. Okay, actually, I don't really feel like reading. Sorry, I'm going to be done. 
My voice is tired. See you later. Have a good rest of your day slash night. Goodbye.